Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I am so happy and grateful to have Jonathan Masalinas with us here today, who for nearly a decade has been helping creatives and entrepreneurs across the country promote their talents and expand their audiences. His ability to highlight the best of what an author brings to the table is uniquely exceptional. With the power of enthusiasm and determination, Jonathan is a seasoned professional taking ideas and turning them into realities. As a publicist for inspirational, spiritual, and children's authors, Jonathan understands the challenges that inspiring and rising authors face as they step out in faith and follow their own paths of experience. He uses his networking savvy, well-developed organizational skills, and positive energy to promote and establish name recognition for all of his clients. A true partner in promotion, Jonathan empowers his clients with the personal attention and dedicated support they need to fulfill their dreams and expand the reach of their work. Jonathan currently resides in San Diego, California, where he's beginning his next steps for the children. His long-term plans include writing his own children's books and opening a children's hospice for terminally ill children in La Jolla. Jonathan, welcome, and thank you so very much for being here. It's always great to meet a new neighbor. It's always great to spend time in someone else's neighborhood. Jesse, I'm very honored and grateful and truly humbled to be a guest on your program. I really enjoy the work that you're doing, the space that you're holding for other people, and, and just your beautiful heart. Yeah, so thanks, thank you, thank you so much. We're Likewise. Have an amazing conversation today. Likewise, and I should tell everybody too, I was, I was fortunate enough to have a, a conversation with Jonathan a few weeks ago, and I was telling him just before we started recording that, if we can capture a fraction of what we captured in that initial phone call, this is gonna be a real treat today. And Jonathan, I wanna start with your enthusiasm because I love that that's highlighted in your bio, bio, a power of enthusiasm. I would certainly say that's a superpower of yours. Why, is, why, is, why do you feel enthusiasm is a superpower for you? It's interesting because the first thing that comes to mind, Jesse, is, is that you know, growing up, I was always an inspirational kind of guy. I would always want to ensure that everyone felt loved and special in their own way. But the catch 22 is that I didn't believe it in myself. I didn't believe in it mm. for me. So I would take the time, uh, you know, your, your listeners and viewers are getting a little bit of a better idea of who I am and the work that I do as a publicist for inspirational, spiritual and children's office. But I actually at one point worked in the collections industry for nearly 13 years, a little bit of a, a different sort of more abrasive energy, so to speak. And there would be times where I'd have friends of mine come to me and I'd ask them, how are you doing? And they would be, the, the typical response would be living the dream, that drenched with sarcasm response, like here I am in this corporate setting, this rat race, you know, got to make sure that I have the nine to five kind of thing. And, you know, I would always say, you know, you're going to have a great day. You're going to have something amazing happen to you. Right. And people would, I had people that would tell me like, you know, Jonathan, when I started my conversation with you, here's where my energy was. And the, at the end of the conversation, here's how I'm feeling. Mm. I feel it's, it's so inheritably important to who we are as hearts and souls. And just as human beings, like there's enough stuff that's happening in the world that's, um, depressing and downtrodden, especially you can just look at, you know, a lot of 2020 in a, in a nutshell, so to speak. And I feel that it's not just, it's not just positive words. I know that on, you know, my own journey, my own awakening, my own healing path, it was important for me to be able to begin to learn to believe those words for myself. I am worthy. I am confident. Mm. I am capable. Great things are happening for me right now. And I kind of had to like, just believe in the words themselves at first, and then, you know, be more, be more in it. So sometimes as the expression goes, you fake it until you make it. So I kind of had to do that for, for a little period of time. But I just there's, there, there's something even more special that happens when you take the time to put that energy out for other people as well, too, because they feel like, you know, for all of your, for all of your Australian following, you go down to the land down under, you throw out the boomerang, right? And if you throw it the right way, it makes its way back to you. So if you, I really believe that if you put out more good and more love and more compassion, yeah, you know what? It might not come back to you three seconds later or a day later or a month later, but you got to trust your, if you're putting more good out into the world, that it makes its way back to you. Because we really live in a transparent society right now. There's no gray it's either you know staying in full truth of who you are 
staying in full authenticity and you know strengthening that link, strengthening that connection, or it's the exact opposite. Um, I feel that one of the things that 2020 taught us is the importance of, uh, I know the, the importance some people may feel about the wearing of the masks, but I feel it's important that we drop off the masks that we wore yes. for a long period of time, which prevented us from being our truest, most authentic selves. So that it's not just positivity. It's not just, uh, uh, you, you know, trying to make someone uh, feel good. It, it, it's so much more deeper than that, both for short term and long term. Jesse, yeah, I want to I dive into that mask a little bit, because I think that one thing that's really coming up for a lot of people, at least conversations I'm overhearing is, is people are questioning, you know, the path that they're on. And it's, it's, and mm. I'm curious for you, how does one make that jump from collections to doing the incredible work that you're doing now to go from collections to doing publicists for children's books? And the reason I asked that by leading with the mask piece is because I feel like on paper, those things seem like complete polar ends of the spectrum. Yep. And I'm imagining some of that happens for you when you're starting to lean into those things you have, you're starting to recognize a sense of self-worthiness and enthusiasm. You're starting to recognize how your energy is affecting other people. Yes. And, and maybe you're starting to listen to that, that inner voice, that inner guidance, whatever it is for you. And I, and I think maybe it'd be worth you taking a minute or two to speak to that because I feel like Jonathan right now, in this year being so unpredictable and so unlike any other year, it's, causing a lot of people to sit back and really question like, why am I doing this? What's the point of this? Mm. If I'm doing this because this is what I'm supposed to do to get to this, but all that's not even promised as you see or as evidenced, mm. maybe just maybe that there's someone seeing watching right now or listening and watching right now who is at that pace, that place where they're questioning that they're starting to question, they're starting to look in the mirror and they're realizing, wait, am I really me or am I wearing a mask? And that mm. there might be an alternative path on there. So I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind, how, how, what got you to make that switch to go from collections to the work you're doing now? I was very blessed also at the same point in time when I worked in collections, I also hosted a popular wrestling radio show called Monday Night Mayhem. Began it in 2002. This was before Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn. This is even before MySpace. As I like to say, it was back in the old GeoCities days, right? <laughs> so it was a matter of, you know, you tell a friend, you tell a friend, you tell a friend. And the thing is, is that, you know, for all the, for all the wrestling fans of, of your program, and I know that you got a wrestling connection yourself, right? Back in 2002, two of the major wrestling companies that are still in existence, uh, TNA Wrestling, which is now known as Impact Wrestling and Ring of Honor, both began. So I was able to establish relationships with, with both companies and really grow with them alongside them. You know, uh, Impact Wrestling would have their Wednesday night pay-per-view. So we would have, always have a guest on prior to their Wednesday night pay-per-views. And I, I always loved meeting new people. I wanted to be able to expand beyond my own comfort zone, even though I was in a comfort zone, if that makes sense. Wrestling, mm -hmm. professional wrestling provided a cathartic effect for myself. So even though my life externally was maybe not what I was, um, was uh, hoping for on a soul level, on a, on, on a deep level within my spirit, uh, it was, you know, one of my saving graces. So, you know, sometimes people will ask me, you know, what was the greatest thing to come out of that experience? Was it traveling across the country to five WrestleManias, interviewing your childhood heroes, becoming good, close, personal friends with Mr. Belding from Saved by the Bell, Dennis Haskins? Uh, None of the none of the above. The, those things were great for what they were, but there were two things that came from that relationship. One is I was me I was blessed to meet a, a very kind, loving soul who I very much classify as a father figure, a gentleman by the name of Dennis DePaolo. He owns a very well known Italian restaurant in the Buffalo and Western New York area called Elio DePaolo's. His father was a famous professional wrestler for many years. Settled down in the uh, late, I believe the late 50s, if I'm not mistaken, and opened up a pizza shop. He mm. didn't want anyone to be hungry. He felt as a professional wrestler, it's the importance of, you know, he wanted to make sure that no one was starving, no one was hungry. So that Italian restaurant grew and grew and grew um, back in the old AFL days, because the stadium is located right by, you know, where the Buffalo Bills play. Mm. So, you know, the Buffalo Bills would come down and they would eat there. So the continued during the Super Bowl years. Uh, Jim Kelly, Thurman Thomas, Bruce Smith, Andre Reed, they all ate at the restaurant, uh, you, know, you know, after the big games. So I share this because Dennis's father 
created wonderful relationships, charitable relationships with different children's charities in the Buffalo area. So unfortunately, Dennis's father, I believe it was about 25 years ago, was crossing the street of his restaurant and got hit by a car and was killed. So Dennis and his brother, Michael, took over the restaurant and continued his father's legacy. Dennis was the one I, I was introduced to him in the spring of 2002. He came to my former college station and we struck up this, this great friendship. Dennis introduced me to the folks at Children's Hospital, then known as Women's and Children's Hospital in Buffalo, which they since built a new hospital called Oshai Children's Hospital. And I was introduced to the team at their child life department. Now, for all of your listeners and viewers, if, if they're wondering, well, what's a child life department at a children's hospital? They provide emotional support and entertainment for children who are going through cancer, dialysis, and simply were just recovering from surgeries. So whenever the professional wrestlers would be going through town, mm. right, I would be the one that would in some way, shape, or form, you know, put in the phone call and say, hey, TNA's coming to town. You know, you might want to contact their PR department kind of thing. So there would be times where, you know, the wrestlers would come with their big shiny gold belts and, you know, the muscle shirts and just the kids' faces would, would, would light up. Lo and behold, you know, that would be some of the early seeds that were planted for my vision of the children's hospice, which I envision as a children's hospice meets Make-A-Wish. It has that child-life connection, that child-life quality to it. So, yeah, looking back in hindsight, you know, I, I, I remember when I was driving around the uh, now – uh, one of the top WWE superstars, Seth Rollins, you know, was driving him around Buffalo. And he even told me, he said, Jonathan, this is my first charitable appearance when he was at Children's Hospital in Buffalo. And knowing the fact that since that point, he has done, you know, make-a-wish things, hospital visits. It, it just has such a, a beautiful space. I, I share that because, you know, both of those experiences were happening at the same point in time. And... Uh, you know, around the time when I released the wrestling radio show, this is shortly after my grandmother passed away in the spring of 2010, I said, you know, I want to help people. I want to inspire people. I want to serve people, but I don't know how. I already ha had all of these different qualities and characteristics that were in place with Monday Night Mayhem, whether it be, you know, working with relationships with the WWE, Impact Wrestling, Ring of Honor, cultivated a relationship with VH1. I had pretty much done everything with the publicity, the promotion, the marketing of the show. And I felt that in some way, shape or form that I could do that mm. for people who have great messages. Mm. So, I, so, I, so I remember coming back from um, Hay House would have these events called the I Can Do It. So I'm not sure if your listeners and viewers may be familiar with that, but that's when Hay House would bring in all their top guns, all their speakers, great authors for a weekend. And you would just be in this weekend of bliss and hearing these amazing messages of love and compassion and kindness and healing being shared. And I remember, I think this was in the, the spring of 2014 or 2000, yeah, 2014. And I said, I wanna help people, I wanna inspire people, I wanna serve people, but I don't know how. And just a simple car drive on the, on the QEW coming from Toronto back to Buffalo, which is where I resided previously before moving out to San Diego. And I remember going to the uh, Erie County Clerk's Office and saying, I want to open up a business. Now, I by far didn't know the first thing about business or anything along the lines of that, um, but I trusted my heart. And it's just become such an amazing how just things have unfolded over the past six, six plus years. Truly a blessing to be able to help other people's visions and dreams take flight. So that's kind of like the Reader's Digest Cliff's Notes plus one version. To Jonathan, the question. There, there's there, that's such good stuff. And I want to, I want to acknowledge you. And then I want to segue into another question. Sure. What I think is so incredible about that story and uh, you know, full disclosure, everybody on here, I think I, if they follow me on social media for a long time, they know I'm a wrestling fan. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that story is the part of the thing I love about wrestling so much is I think WWE is consistently some of their talents are amongst the top people every year and of all time of people who go and grant wishes. And they do an amazing sure. job of showcasing these beautiful things. I, every year at WrestleMania now, they highlight this, this uh, award called, um, it's the Connor's Cure Award. They started after a foundation of this terminally ill kid named Connor, who right. Daniel Bryan did a make a wish for. Daniel Bryan's one of the top people in, in WWE. He was so moved by it. Everybody was so moved by it. And now Connor's Cure is a, I think a nonprofit that WWE started and they help with terminal children. 
But so That's the reason correct. I want to start with that is because I think it's so incredible that this is such a meaningful, as a fan of wrestling, one of the most meaningful parts about being a fan and what makes me proud to be a fan of professional wrestling is seeing them do things like that, seeing the proactivity they have with doing organizations like Making a Wish and making time for terminal ill kids. And, yes. you know, I think John Cena has granted more wishes than anyone else. So to hear that too. you were back helping orchestrate that behind the scenes before it was so, it was, it was what it is now, I think that's just such an incredible thing. And I just, I want to th- acknowledge you for that because I can't tell you how much meaning and inspiration and hope I've derived from observing those things. Mm. And, you know, to think of like, you were there to support a Seth Rollins, who's now a superstar, go through and get his feet wet in that. And I can imagine how much impact he has on the lives of children now. I think that's just really incredible. And I, I just, I think that that's so incredible that you were willing to do that. And you were willing to put yourself out there, put your heart out there, make things, things, things possible. And I just, in hearing the story, I like to believe that so many children's lives are made better now because of what you were willing to do all those years ago behind the scenes when nobody was watching and before there was internet, before there was social media, before there was all those things, before it, when it was just a good human being helping other human beings put a smile on some kids' faces that are going through a tough time. And to hear now that you've taken that and you're using that to go into this next phase of life where now you're not only supporting these authors, but you're wanting to eventually open up this children's center. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that because I think this is fascinating that you have these, these beautiful stories that are all interconnected and they build so beautifully to kind of where you're at right now and where you're going. So, so tell us a little bit about your, your, your big purpose and your goal of opening up the children's hospital. It's interesting because uh, I was in San Diego for the first time in the spring of 2005, fittingly enough, for WrestleMania 21, which was in Los Angeles. You see how everything just comes back to wrestling. I, it, it can't leave even though it's left me, if that makes sense, right? So, you know, seven years after I released Monday Night Mayhem back into the universe. So I also used to work at Blockbuster Video, little known fact, you know, some of your listeners and viewers may remember the time where we would rent movies, right? It was such a great thing. Like you could go to the movie store on Friday night and get three movies and just pop some popcorn, you know, when times were simpler, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so my one of my one of my friends and colleagues who I work with, his brother was one of the former head scouts for the San Diego Chargers. And he said, uh, you want to go out to L.A. for WrestleMania 21. Now, this was 2005. And I had the the, the only trip that I'd ever taken, I believe I took a trip to uh, Madison Square Garden for WrestleMania 20 and for and to Nashville, Tennessee for um, for one of the TN, or two of the TNA if I'm not mistaken. So I said, absolutely. You know, hopped on a plane, went to San Diego. It was the first time that I saw palm trees. I clearly and distinctly remember that weekend that I was there because we landed up staying in San Diego for a couple of days. That's where, that's where my friend Dan's brother lived with his, his fiance girlfriend. And I remember that time because it was also the weekend where Pope John Paul II transitioned. Hmm. And I also really remember that week because you know, up until my recent move to San Diego, it was the greatest night of sleep that I ever had in my entire life. Now, most times, you know, you go up to someone on the street and you say, hey, I remember the greatest night of sleep in my entire life that I ever had. Someone be like, dude or ma'am, like, you know, <laughs> you've had tens of thousands of nights of sleep or, you know, lots of, how do you remember one night? It was just this 13 hours, peaceful, blissful, restorative, right? So we spent a couple of days in San Diego and then an overnight in LA, go to the Hall of Fame ceremonies at the Gibson Amphitheater, go to Staples Center for WrestleMania. But I share this because we found our way to La Jolla. There is an area in La Jolla called uh, Children's Pool Beach. It's right on the La Jolla Cove. And it's got this beautiful walkway where literally you're kind of like winding around. And at the end of the walkway, you can kind of almost do like this Leonardo DiCaprio on the King of the World impersonation with Titanic. It's literally like you're in the Pacific Ocean. You're almost, you're literally in the Pacific Ocean, right? And you look around and surrounding you is Children's Pool Beach. So it's this beautiful area that for part of the year is sequestered off for seal and otter families to populate. And then there's part of the year where, you know, children can be on there and it's this really small beach. But I took a picture of myself 
when I was there at Children's Pool Beach and I held onto that picture. Now I looked completely different at one point in time. As a disclaimer, I used to weigh over 300 pounds. So I mean, I, I carried a lot of a lot of emotional weight, a lot of baggage with me beforehand years ago. And I kept that picture and I didn't necessarily know why. And I, I, that was literally one of the most amazing experiences that my soul ever had. And I didn't necessarily know as to whether or not that I would get back to California because, you know, I had to go through, you know, different things on my own path and in my own journey, right? So, you know, things became increasingly clear that I was meant to go to California. I wasn't sure if it was Los Angeles or San Diego. And uh, in the summer of 2019, I went out to LA for a week and San Diego for a week and realized it's not LA, even though I was kind of getting some hits on LA. And then I came to San Diego and I said, yep, this is it. And I went back to that same place, Children's Pool Beach, and I started weeping openly weeping tears of joy. I said, you know, God, universe, my grandmother, because she's very much my guardian angel. I'm, I'm part Polish. So, you know, Bapcha, we call our grandmother's Bapcha, right? Bapcha and Jaja, grandmother and grandfather. And, you know, uh, even then, you know, when I, when I came back to Buffalo for, for a brief period of time before I moved in, uh, in October of, uh, of this past year, October, 2020, I, I, I literally surrendered everything. I said, you know, God, I'm not wasting any more time. I'm not here to putz around. I'm here to do what it is that I'm meant to do for the kids. And this, this vision that I have has been very clear in my mind. I now, I, I'd like to again provide another disclaimer. This will be after COVID is long since in the rearview mirror. We won't be wearing masks. We won't be six feet social distancing. I envision that this is a safe space for children to be able to be in heaven before going to heaven. So you have the beautiful visual of looking out in the ocean and you, and yes, you have the, you know, the, the hospice energy. So you have, you know, medical practitioners that are there in terms of doctors and nurses, but you also bring in, uh, you know, Reiki masters, you bring in children's authors, you bring in spiritual teachers, you bring in professional wrestlers, right? And they all connect with the children, parents, and families to create this, end of life experience. So again, it's kind of like that make a wish child life vibe combined with a children's hospice, because one of my messages for the children is that love never dies, that it only changes form. And I think that this center will provide a lot of help and support for children, acknowledging the fact that they're not alone, that death is nothing to be scared of, nothing to be afraid of, I mentioned one last brief thing, and I remember when my grandmother transitioned on the surface, it may have looked like one of the most traumatic experiences of my entire life. At that point, that was true, but I developed such a strong, deeper connection with my grandmother that, you know, from speaking with her in prayer and meditation to getting the signs and the signals that she was sharing with me to the earth angels that she placed across my path. Like, I really believe that my grandmother brought you into my life for such a beautiful reason, mm. right? And it's just like, I, I'm so grateful for this experience along the way. So people might, people have asked me like, how's this going to happen, Jonathan? Like, you're not a doctor, you're not a nurse. And I go to the example of how St. Uh, Jude's uh, Children's Hospital was built. Danny Thomas, who was the founder of St. Jude's Children's House, he was just a famous actor. He had a big platform on his end of things. He began doing a lot of fundraising and all of a sudden, boom, Children's Hospital begins to be built, right? So that held on to a lot of hope, full pun intended with, you know, with your program, because it's like someone did something similar in his own way. I feel that being of service in whatever way that it's, that it's shown for me, working with an inspirational author, helping a spiritual author, uh, you know, s supporting a children's author. I feel that the road to La Jolla and walking each other home, that's going to be the name of the center as a little homage, a tip of the cap to Ram Das. I was introduced to his work several years ago, and he just said something to the effect of in many of his talks and books, you know, we're all just all walking each other home. Mm. So I envision this spiritual staircase. Yes, we're all helping to walk one another back home. We're taking that step, that next step, that next step, that next step. So I really believe, again, just putting more good out into the world, being of service, doing the right thing, loving myself, uh, you know, going outside of my comfort zone, like all of these things over time, these are the building blocks. These are the building blocks that will help that center to 
open at some point in time in the foreseeable future. Whenever it's meant to happen, however it's meant to look. Jonathan, why, why, why should adults read children's books? I can maybe not necessarily say single-handedly, but I can say that a large part of my healing, I would not be here today if it were not for children's books. As adults, we take life way, way, way too seriously. We have our to-do lists, right? In fact, I've got mine sitting to the left of me that I have to update. <laughs> and it's like, we got to, you know, uh, we got to cook breakfast for the kids. We got to, you know, pay the mortgage. We got to run down to the dry cleaner, pick up the dry cleaning. We got to put gas in the car. Then we got to go back and pay the car insurance. Then we got to pick up the kids from school. Then we got a couple of meetings and conferences. Then maybe we'll get in like 30 minutes of Qigong or, or, or a workout routine. And many of us, especially with 2020, you know, how many people you probably came across that said, man, I just want this year to be over with. And it's like people were just wanting to press this giant fast forward button into 2021. Children's books, Jesse, they help us to be, and this may sound like a cliche, but it's, it's the total truth. Children's books help us to be more in the present moment. Hmm. They allow us to realize and remember the simple things in life. To have, you know, you know, to have that reconnection or that strengthening of the connection with our inner child. Right, you know, children's books provide a lot of wonder and awe and excitement that really helps. You know, I I like to do what what I call you know disbelief, the spiritual science experiment. I encourage your listeners and viewers to go to Barnes and Noble, to go to a children's bookstore in your area, even go to Amazon if that's your cup of tea, right? And purchase a children's book and read it and see how you feel afterwards. Because there's something, there's something inherently important about that. It helps to open up your heart. I feel that, again, you know, many of us, we, we tend to think that healing can only happen through pill or seeing a therapist. Not saying that those things aren't, you know, that, that they don't help people along the way. But I feel that if more adults read children's books, not only would they have a, a more meaningful and loving relationship with themselves, relationships with their children will increase. So if you have a stronger connection with inner, with inner Jesse, with little Jesse, yes. I have a stronger connection with little inner Jonathan, right? I'm not blessed to be a father. I feel at some point in time, I will. Um, I know that the relationship with my little one, when that happens, will be that much more enjoyable, heartfelt, so many, much, so many more beautiful and magical experiences as the result of that. Plus, you know, let's, there, it, 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 just, it provides just so much value, extra added value and heart-centered energy into your life and day. Yeah, you can binge on Netflix. Right. You know, you can watch, you know, the latest, you know, college basketball or NFL game. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But who is to say that you'll have a greater likelihood of remembering something endearing in a children's book versus who caught that touchdown yeah. pass, you know, 20 years later kind of thing. I'm I've, I've done this for the last few years, Jonathan, where between Thanksgiving and New Year's, I only read fiction as just like a treat to myself. And I was sitting there couple weeks ago what am I going to read during this time and I looked over on my bookshelf and I realized I had the entire chronicles of Narnia and mm -hmm. I hadn't read it yet and I was like god how have I not read Narnia because the lion the witch and the wardrobe is one of my favorite movies favorite stories and there's a there's a dedication in it from C.S. Lewis to his goddaughter I think her name is Lucy and he says something to the effect that my dear Lucy I've realized now in writing this that by the time I finish writing it, you'll be too old to read it because children grow fat much faster than fairy tales are written. But he said, there will come a time where I'm going to gift it to you anyways, because there will come a time at some point where suddenly you'll be old enough to read it again, where you'll dust it off of your shelf and you'll find yourself wanting to, wanting to escape into mystical lands and fairy tales. And I, you know, essentially look forward to you enjoying it at that time. And I love that you referenced the inner child piece with books because 
I found that to be blissfully true for myself is when I allow myself to watch, you know, whether it's Marvel movies or read kind of read Narnia, it does allow me to escape into a different world of just, gosh, like, look at how simple. And there's, you, there's almost a simplicity in the, in the lessons, the morals of it, the, the essences of the story, which often gets lost in the complexity of what we call, call quote unquote adult stuff, because we're trying to make it more detailed and more complex and more intricate when the human experience is really simplified in there. So I, I love that you said that. Jonathan, we're, we're coming up on time here. So before I ask my final question, where can people, where's the best places for people to find, connect with you online, learn more about what you have going up to? I appreciate you, you sharing that, Jesse. Uh, the easiest way, the, the, the primal destination to be able to check out is the Empowered Publicity website, which is empoweredpublicity.com, on Facebook and Instagram at Empowered Publicity, and Twitter at Empowered underscore PR. One of the things that I also wanted to mention, this really uh, shines a light even more so on why it is that I, what, what it is that I do for the children, and you know that whole bridge to walking each other home, <clears throat> the Empowered Publicity Children's Book Spotlight Series is a program that I've been blessed to host for the past two plus years, where some of the top award-winning and best-selling children's authors, and what I like to call the rising stars in the kid lit community, I interview new episodes are released every Monday at seven o'clock Eastern, four o'clock Pacific on Empowered Publicity's YouTube channel. That's just, you know, it's interesting because like having the opportunity to interview, you know, Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels, Kurt Angle, uh, I mean, all those guys, like those experiences were great, but I have such, so much fun, so much joy. It's literally been the most fun and enjoyment that I've had doing any form of, of, of interview series that I've actually done. So uh, we just recently celebrated our hundredth episode as well too. So it's just, uh, I'm very blessed for the support that people have given for that. And also the Empowered Publicity Storytime with Mr. Jonathan. Right uh, at the very beginning of 2020, I wanted to give a special gift to the children, parents and families in Buffalo and Western New York before moving out to San Diego. So I had created a, a story time series called Story Time with Mr. Jonathan. The intention was to share brand new heartfelt and heart-centered children's books while also connecting to the universal heart and sharing messages within each book. So not just reading the book to the little ones and that's that, but creating a conversation with them, creating a dialogue with them. I really learned that especially from Mr. Rogers, from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was very much one of my dearest sorts of inspiration and role models. He didn't talk down to children. He didn't talk around them. He didn't pretend like they, you know, he pretended like they existed, right? He would have conversations with them. So I began doing the story time series as a physical event in Buffalo. Of course, COVID happened. So I shifted the story time online and just the support that, you know, children's authors, parents, educators have shown for the story time. Mr. Jonathan has become one of the more popular story time series online for kids. New episodes are uploaded a couple of times per month as well, too. So I like to classify those as the perfect bookend. So if your little one is looking for something really uh, enjoyable and fun where they can also learn in the process, there's the story time with Mr. Jonathan. If you're a children's author or a children's illustrator, an entrepreneur, just someone who loves great children's books, then you can go down the route of the children's book spotlight series. But yeah, if, if anyone uh, out there that you that is tuning into this program that's a listener, that's a viewer, that's a follower of yours on social media. If they like empowered publicity, they really feel that I can help them in some way, shape, or form, whether it be to create a book media tour in a city of their choosing, a virtual media tour, if they'd like to learn more about media coaching and mentoring as well. There's, there's different ways that, that I'm of service. And there's a, there's a reason why empowered publicity is called PR from the heart. I want to mention that before we conclude our time together tonight, because, you know, in, in different sort of businesses, you know, sometimes people will put the profit before the person. And yes, you know, it's important that we honor our time, our energy, our, our creativity, our services, because if everyone, as I like to tell people, you know, if this were up to me sometimes, I'd be up on a top of a mountain like St. Francis of Assisi, we're in the robe and reading children's books to kids 18 hours a day, if, you know, money were not a thing, right? That's just the, the, the exchange that we have to honor one another's time and 
and, and, and energy and creativity and services. Uh, this work really means a lot to me because I feel that when you help someone share their story, someone is entrusting me with, with a part of their life's purpose or their entire life's purpose. And that's, and that's very sacred. And I really classify all relationships now, especially as sacred. So yeah, uh, long story short, empoweredpublicity.com, Facebook and Instagram at Empowered Publicity, Twitter at Empowered underscore PR. And uh, you're, you're doing such incredible work, Jesse. I mean, this is, you know, I, again, I have seen so many podcasts, television shows, different forms of platforms, social media, you name it over the years. And just the purity of your heart the intention of why you're doing what you're doing, the fact that you're still here. You had an opportunity to check out and say, eh, maybe we'll do this next left, you know, next lifetime or the lifetime thereafter. And you persevered, you, you moved through a lot in your own journey. And I, and I am so grateful for our time together in our first conversation and in this conversation. And, and just as a, a, final, uh, a final wish that I put out for you, for all of your listeners, your viewers, for all that are following you on social media, continues to support Jesse. Conti whether it be the like on Facebook, whether it be the, the heart on Instagram, whether it be posting a nice comment, subscribing to his podcast, there are so many ways that you can be of service to Jesse to show him how much that we love, we care about him, to remind him how special that he is. Continue to do that because the world needs more of Jesse, the world needs more of what he's putting out there in the world as well too. So that, so that's my wish that I'm putting out there for you and the and the the wonderful uh, heartfelt intention for for all of your listeners and viewers, as I like to call the friends and neighbors of your program. Thanks, Jonathan, for that. So we in the final just few seconds we have, I wonder if you could just take a second and Jonathan has the coolest mug that he's drinking out of <laughs> I was hoping that you might show your mug off and why you chose that mug and yeah I, I, and why he's doing that i'll just share this with you really quickly what's on jonathan's mug or who's on jonathan's mug is something and if you can't see it right now for those of you who are listening he has a mug that's the care bears and i've often used the care bear stare as a teaching point in workshops so jonathan i'll just let you share real quickly why the care bears Growing up, when I was five or six years old, I was introduced to the Care Bears. And in fact, you know, for whatever reason, I seem to be fans of movies that have the second, like the second installment versus the first. So there was a movie, Care Bears 2, The Next Generation. And that's when the world was introduced to the Care Bear Cubs. So one of my favorite stuffed animals growing up, one of my go-tos was Bright Heart Rac or it was uh, a Brave Heart Raccoon. I, I, I keep, there, there was like a Bright Heart Lion and a Brave Heart Raccoon. Braveheart raccoon, right? So it's the super adorable raccoon that's got uh, a light bulb on his tummy shaped in the form of a heart, right? And so, you know, we, you know as we get older, we move on from our stuffed animals, so to speak. And, and I remember this was probably around like 2016, if I'm not mistaken. And I saw when I was in Toys R Us, yes, Toys R Us, great store. I still affirm it as if it's in the present tense, because if you actually, in Canada and the UK, I believe Toys R Us still exists, by the way. But they were uh, American Greetings. The greeting card company is the one that has the license for, for the Care Bear products. And so I found uh, 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 Braveheart Raccoon. I, I want to call him Brightheart Raccoon. I think it's the raccoon Braveheart. or the Care Bears. Braveheart was Braveheart was a lion because Braveheart was the my Brightheart. Favorite. Braveheart. Brightheart. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was my favorite when they introduced those. Is I loved that little lion, and I think it was he was either Braveheart or Tenderheart because there was a Tenderheart too. There is. Yes. Yeah. So so I so I saw Brightheart raccoon, and I said, "You've got to be kidding me!" So I remember, you know, I said, "The next time I'm going to come back to Toys R Us, I'm going to purchase it." And this is when I really began to reconnect back with my inner child, and so. I purchased that Care Bear, and that's one that I still have. And in fact, one of the things that I actually do, I feel that there is so much healing energy, not only in children's books, but also in Care Bears. So what I do several times a year is I will actually purchase Care Bears from eBay because they don't make them in mass quantities and mass production like they used to. I'll purchase Care Bears from different, you know, uh, from, you know, different places that feel aligned, and I'll send them out to children all around the world. Because I feel that just, you know, Care Bears just represent that childlike innocence 
and wonder. And as times as kids were afraid, you know, we see, you know, things going on in our home from whether it be, you know, mom and dad fighting or, you know, grandma just recently passes away or maybe a child just doesn't simply feel like they're loved and special. That's why at the end of all of my broadcasts, as a little tip of the cap to Mr. Rogers, but really in my own way, I always remind everyone that's tuning in that you are perfect, you are whole, you are healthy, you are complete, you are loved, you are special, just the way that you are. Yeah. That I like you just the way that you are. And I'll also uh, mention this as we conclude our time together. You know, Mr. Rogers somehow weighed 143 pounds for his entire natural adult life. He had the number 143, which is in his, in his language and religion was his way of saying, I love you. One letter in I, four letters in love, three letters in you. So I always like to say 243. So to all of your listeners and viewers tuning in, there's two letters in love, or two letters in we, four letters in love, three letters in you. And Jesse and I very much love all of you. So there's a little, we've talked about professional wrestling. We've talked about Care Bears. We've talked about children's books. We've talked about so much goodness in this program today. Yes. So much John, great stuff. John says, this has been such a treat. And everybody, my goodness, is there so much to dive into, rewatch, re-listen to everything Jonathan shared. What a beautiful journey he took us on the day. Starting off about enthusiasm being a superpower. And my goodness, is he an enthusiastic guy? And I, <laughs> I find with myself that I have my, my, my muscles, my face muscles are actually sore from smiling. I was smiling the entire time Jonathan was talking because his enthusiasm is that contagious and more than being contagious is it's so genuine, so sincere. It I appreciate really that. Out of him just so powerfully. And I love the stories he told, you know, one thing that really came up from some of the stories that Jonathan told today is it's the, it's the power of just leaning into those relationships and following your heart and doing what's right. And I want to reiterate that because here's a guy who was doing collections work. But he started to notice and meet good people, people he resonates, people he connected with. He followed a passion that was kind of an obscure passion of doing radio hosting for wrestling. And then the next thing you know, he's taking around and facilitating these meetings with wrestlers and children's hospital and helping terminally ill kids brighten their day a little bit by introducing them to some of their superheroes. Those of you who are not fans of the wrestling industry, that is a huge part of the charitable work that at least the WWE, which is the main mainstay, the kind of granddaddy of wrestling, does and it's incredible to hear that Jonathan did that and that that sparked something in him that then he went and followed another path and now leading him to his life's work of helping these helping get public helping be a publicist to authors and getting these incredible children's books out there to ultimately lead him to building the children's hospice hospital it's a long way of saying folks that you don't have to have all the steps figured out you don't have to have all the coordinates in the map you just have to be willing to trust your heart and follow it and I think Jonathan even said it in here that he didn't know he's just kind of surrendering to God, spirit, universe, whomever it was that he's going to do an act of trust. And sometimes that's really what we have to do because so many of us have been left questioning what's truth, what's real, what's fact from fiction. What's the point of this all here in this crazy year that's been 2020. And at the time of this recording, it's early December, 2020. So it may be 2021 by the time you're watching and listening to this or beyond. But the point is this, you know, the, I'll, I'll leave you all with this is that there is a wise philosopher by the name of John Connor who said, the future is not yet set. We have no fate, but what we make for ourselves. And mm -hmm. consider that for yourselves about what you want your fate to be. And sometimes it might show up as an obscure encounter with an individual. Sometimes it might show up as a, as a, in, as a yearning inside your heart. And it may not all make sense at once, but if you lean into that inner child, put on a Care Bear stare, tap into that wisdom you had as a child and be willing to follow your heart. It will take you to some incredibly beautiful places. And I'm so grateful that our paths were able to cross Jonathan and it brought us to this beautiful place today. This has been such a gift. So grateful for you, for the work you're doing now, the incredible work you're going to do, the lives you're going to affect. You are just a magical human being. And I have no doubt that you are going to provide many heavenly experiences for those who are young and who are on their way to heaven far too soon, but gifting them with a heaven on earth. I, I can see it. I can feel it from you. And I just thank you for sharing with us today and for you following your passion purpose. I just got chills when you, when you share that. So if I needed validation, sometimes, you know, even though we feel we're very much on our path and fully connected to our purpose, we need that little extra validation. Yeah. I got the chills. So that's, that's the validation that I, that I got, and then I got rid of the validation from yourself. So Jesse, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. This is one of my favorite interviews 
that have ever had the opportunity to do either being interviewed or being the one who is interviewing someone else. And, and seriously, keep up, keep up the wonderful work that, that you're doing, the great services that, 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 that you're providing. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing how your journey unfolds in the process. And who knows, I, I think that we, we, we just scraped the surface and maybe there is in here, there is a, there is a second interview down the pipeline yeah, at, the, at so. the very least. I agree, Jonathan. I absolutely agree. And then when all this uh, COVID stuff goes, since everything always comes back to wrestling, I'll have to invite you up and for one of the big four one of these days. <laughs> if, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you this way, is, is that if there, because I, I, I don't pay attention to wrestling, nowhere near in the way in which I did before. I haven't been to a wrestling event in years. If I were to be in that setting for a one-time experience, that would be an invitation that would seem that would seem aligned, so to speak. So, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it more. All right, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you next time on another edition of A Handful of Hope. Bye-bye.